Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I am Dr. Whitney Coster's Professor of English, and today we're gonna to tackle some poetry by examining Robert Browning's My Last Duchess. If you enjoy free, easy to understand analyses of classic literature that you're likely to come across in school or in life in general, then please subscribe to this channel because that is what we do here. Now, My Last Duchess is a dramatic monologue, and that means that one person speaks to a silent listener. In this poem, then, the Duke speaks to an envoy or a messenger about his last duchess, who is no longer living. Because the envoy's role is as listener only, we never learn exactly what he makes of the Duke's speech. Now, the envoy may never react, but we as readers certainly should talk about all the thoughts and feelings that pop into our heads as the Duke speaks. When I teach this poem, I always ask my students to write down exactly what the Duke says about himself and the Duchess. I let them peruse the poem, taking words and phrases that the Duke uses to describe both of them. Then I ask them to put the poem away so that they can't see it. And I ask them to write down what their gut feeling is about both the Duke and the Duchess. And they always find that they have two very different lists. And this is because the Duke is an unreliable narrator. Readers often make the mistake of implicitly trusting the narrator, believing that the narrator's job is to tell the truth, be totally objective and agenda free. Now, while most narrators are reliable, it doesn't mean that you should just blindly depend on the notion that they'll never lead you astray. I mean, if we believed everything that the Duke told us, we would be in a lot of trouble. So, what are we dealing with here? Well, the Duke used to be married to a Duchess, but she has since died, and now the Duke has his sights set on a new woman. But before any sort of marriage can take place, this woman's father has sent an envoy or a messenger to visit the Duke, observe his personality, character, his friends, and living situation, and then the envoy will return to the Count and inform him of his observations. The Count will then use the envoy's information to determine if the Duke is a good match for his daughter or not. Now, the Duke himself is very aware of the envoy's purpose, so you would think that he would be on his best behavior, right? Now, the poem begins as the Duke starts to show the envoy his art collection. It's obvious from the get-go that the Duke enjoys bragging about who he knows and what he has because they both highlight his social status. Among his collection is a portrait of his last duchess that is hanging on the wall. And the Duke asks the envoy to sit and look at it. Now it's important to note that the envoy doesn't just come across the painting and ask about it. No, 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 no. The painting is actually hidden behind a curtain which only the Duke may open and close. This means that he has full control over who does and doesn't see her. Looking at the portrait, the envoy notices a spot of joy on the Duchess's cheek, and it's his inquiry about it that sets the Duke off on a litany of complaints about the Duchess. He says, Sir, twas not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf, the artist, chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Translation, while the Duchess was happy to see the Duke, she was equally happy to see others too. In fact, the reason this spot of joy is even in the painting is because it appeared on the Duchess's face after the painter complimented her during their session. I sense some jealousy here. Oh, but it gets so much worse, according to the Duke. The Duke tells the envoy, the Duchess had a heart too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere. Oh, sir, she smiled no doubt whenever I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Sir, it was all one, my favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherry some of fishes full, broken the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all in each would draw from her alike the same approving speech. Now don't forget that the envoy is going to report all this back to the count who may wonder what happened to the Duke's previous wife. 
the Duke presents himself as a victim of the Duchess's indiscretions, inconsideration, and disrespect, making it seem like the Duchess not only continuously insulted him by treating his family name and heritage on par with basic things, but also was unfaithful to him since she refused to be discriminating with whom or what she gave her attention to. So, yeah, she may have shown me affection and been happy to see me, but I saw her betray those same feelings to others, too. In other words, the Duchess enjoys the simple things in life and finds the Duke no more special or extraordinary than anyone else. Sounds so terrible, huh? Well, it is to someone like the Duke. As the Duke airs his grievances about the Duchess, he really reveals more about himself than he ever does about her. In fact, his words contradict implications that are made. The more he speaks, the more untrustworthy he becomes. And you should keep that in mind as you interpret what he says. In truth, he is no victim. He is a domineering, controlling, arrogant, proud, aggressive man who was insulted by a woman who didn't share his classist, narcissistic outlook on life. Even the poem's form, a dramatic monologue, and its rhythm, iambic pentameter, help reflect the Duke's controlling, powerful, and conceited nature. What do I mean by this? Well, since the poem is a dramatic monologue, the Duke has full control over what is said, heard, and done from beginning to end. The other character, the envoy, has no agency or voice, and of course, neither does the Duchess. So when the Duke speaks, it's done in a very structured and controlled manner, iambic pentameter, which means that there are 10 syllables per line with every other syllable stressed. So for example, you would say, how such a glance came there, so not the first are you to turn and ask thus. I'm being a little emphatic so you can hear it. The Duke also employs rhyming couplets throughout. If you go through the poem, you'll find words like durst, first, not, spot, perhaps, lapse, paint, faint, for instance. In other words, everything is tightly controlled by the Duke. And this starts to reveal what the Duchess's real offense was. She was never unfaithful or abusive to the Duke. She simply didn't behave the way he wanted her to. She wasn't controllable. She just didn't understand what her place was, and the Duke was certainly not going to teach her. He says, who would stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, he totally does, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, just this or that in you, disgust me. Here you miss or there you exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Translation, he's saying no self-respecting person like myself would ever lower themselves to acknowledge or correct this type of behavior. It's beneath him. Instead of teaching her how to behave, he explains, he gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Um, I think that the Duke just confessed to ordering the Duchess's murder to the very man who has a hand in arranging his next marriage. Now here is the question that Browning is asking us to reckon with. Why would the Duke reveal all this to the envoy? We know that the Duke is a very aggressive, powerful man who has been driven by anger and bitterness. Clearly, he's someone who is used to getting what he wants. So do you think that the Duke became so enraged when he revealed the Duchess's painting that he accidentally slipped and mistakenly revealed that he had his wife murdered? As much as he must exert control over everything and everyone, it seems he lacks self-control. Or do you think that the Duke is so arrogant that he is very skillfully giving instructions to the envoy on the sort of behavior he expects in his future wife? In other words, is this whole monologue one big warning that anyone he marries will be under his control, and if they don't follow his rules or meet his expectations, he will have them killed? Directly following his admission that he killed his wife, he says, Will please you rise? We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the count your master's known munificence, 
generosity, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed, at starting is my object. Well, we can read this in two ways. That the Duke has revealed too much, has realized his mistake, and is now quickly trying to change the subject by focusing on the Count's generosity and what the Duke hopes to get from this potential marriage. Or he's changing the subject because the only point he wanted to make, namely that his future wife had better obey, has been made and now they can move on to something else. What's additionally disturbing is the last thing the Duke says about the Duchess is, there she stands as if alive. The Duchess is now part of his art collection and this version of her is far better for him. That spot of joy is finally now reserved just for him and for those he permits to see the painting. She is voiceless, powerless, and perfect as an object that highlights his collection and his wealth. Most importantly, she is fully within his control, as her portrait is hidden behind a curtain. Noticeably, as they start to head down, the Duke points out one more thing to the envoy. He says, Notice Neptune taming a seahorse, thought a rarity which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Here he is name dropping, bragging that he's got the status and money to get a rare statue, and metaphorically referencing the power dynamics that exist between him and women. The Duke sees himself like Neptune, a god who tames and controls weak and passive women. Even the title of the poem is foreboding because it suggests that a slew of duchesses has existed even prior to this last duchess, thus making the last duchess not only part of his art collection, but part of his collection of duchesses as well. So let's hope that the envoy returned to the count with a big resounding no. What do you guys think? Is this monologue a very clearly designed warning to the envoy or an emotional slip up by an enraged, petty and embittered man? I would love to explore the poem further with you in the comment section below, so please share with me your thoughts. I really hope that this lecture helped clarify the poem for you, because I know that poetry can be rather tricky, especially when it employs language that is just not commonly used today. For further help with literature, please subscribe to the channel so that you're kept up to date on new postings, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.